I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. How do you feel about being a servant? In South Africa, there is a pervasive stigma attached to being labeled or thought of as a servant. A servant does not normally have a high social standing in South African society or for that matter in any society, even during the time of Jesus. Yet the scriptures declare that those of us who believe in Jesus are servants of God. Think about that for a while. How do you feel about being a servant of God? Back in Revelation 5, which was covered in episode 29 of this podcast, we saw God holding a seven-sealed scroll that contains His promise and plan for healing the world. And we saw the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, being revealed as the only one worthy to take that scroll and remove the seals to disclose and execute God's plan for the final stages of human history. The first few chapters of Revelation show a basic level of symbolism, with easily recognizable language and imagery. Chapter 6 marks something of a change as the imagery becomes more and more elaborate. The symbolism in the book of Revelation must always be considered when reading and interpreting John's visions. Not all of the imagery in Revelation is meant to be understood in absolutely literal terms, and not all images are meant to be interpreted symbolically. In some cases, John describes literal events using dramatic and poetic language, so context and caution are needed to understand which passages fall into which category. In Revelation 6, we saw the Lamb open six of the seven seals of the scroll, releasing the four horsemen of the Apocalypse, then the revealing of the martyrs at the altar of heaven who have been killed during the Great Tribulation, making them believers who came to Christ after the rapture. The sixth seal releases a catastrophic series of natural disasters. The description here reveals earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, meter showers and the darkening of the sky, and even atmospheric disruptions. These events are so extreme that even the rich and powerful cower in fear, and the people of earth have to acknowledge that these events are the result of the wrath and the judgments of God. It will be helpful for you, listening to this podcast, to remember that in Revelation there are three series of seven events that occupy the last seven years of human history. The first series is the opening of the seven seals, and the seven trumpets that will sound, and the seven bowls of wrath which will be poured out upon the earth. Each of these series of sevens is broken into four events, and then three events. Four of those events are visible and easy to recognize, and then three events that are going on behind the scenes, in the spiritual realm. However, surprisingly in Revelation 7, we don't see the Lamb open the seventh seal. Instead, we come to a pause between the first six seals and the seventh and final seal. In this interlude, in Revelation 7, God shows us what I feel to be a flashback that supplies a missing piece of the Revelation puzzle. We are taken back to the beginning of the judgments and see God's plan from a different vantage point. We see the selection of a special group of Israelites who will be given a special mission during the last days. I will go back a little to verse 2 of chapter 7 of Revelation just to give us a little context again. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, a hundred and forty-four thousand, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Judah were sealed, twelve thousand from the tribe of Reuben, twelve thousand from the tribe of Gad, twelve thousand from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. John lists 12 names of 12 tribes, 
but we must be careful not to glance over these names too quickly. We all tend to skip over what we consider to be irrelevant. I sometimes get a bit frustrated with my wife when we watch a movie or TV series and she wants me to stop so that she can understand who the names of the various characters are and how they relate to the overall story. I should not get frustrated. It is important and I should learn from her. This is the lesson we all need to learn with Revelation, in fact, all of Scripture. We need to see the same things God emphasizes when He gave His servant John this vision. What God is underscoring in these verses is an important truth. It is Israel and only Israel that is mentioned in this passage. 144,000 Israelites who are sealed for the service of God by the Holy Spirit. Many preachers within the Pentecostal and Evangelical Church have attempted to prove that the 144,000 sealed servants listed in this passage are in fact the church. But when God says Israel, He means Israel. This text does not talk about the church, but in this passage, God is describing Jews or the true Israel. A classic example of incorrect scriptural appropriation are the Jehovah's Witnesses who also took this particular passage of scripture and applied it to themselves, saying that the servants of Revelation 7 are not Jews, but are rather Jehovah's Witnesses. According to their interpretation, only 144,000 souls would be saved, and all of these would be Jehovah's Witnesses. However, when the membership of the Jehovah's Witnesses grew beyond 144,000, they had a problem. What would God do with the leftovers? Their teachers started another category of 144,000. They taught that there would be an earthly band of 144,000 and a heavenly band of 144,000 as well. So, if you belong to the Jehovah's Witnesses cult in the early decades of the 20th century, you would belong to the heavenly band. However, after a few decades passed, they had another problem. The number of Jehovah's Witnesses had grown larger to 288,000. So they created a third band of 144,000 called the Servant Band. If you are part of the Jehovah's Witnesses today, it seems you must come in at the Servant level. This is just one example of the many ways people can distort scripture to make it fit a program of human devising. In this passage that I read, God clearly identifies the 144,000 servants. And you may have noticed that two tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Dan, are not mentioned here. The tribes of Ephraim's brother Manasseh and Joseph are included, but not Ephraim. Ephraim and Manasseh were the two sons of Joseph. Because of Joseph's role in preserving the nation of Egypt during the Great Famine and his role in preserving his own family, including the brothers who sold him into slavery, Joseph's two sons were adopted by Jacob and given an inheritance along with the rest of Joseph's brothers. The thirteenth tribe was Levi. When the land of Israel was divided among the tribes, the tribe of Levi was left out because the Levites were called out especially to be the tribe of priests whose inheritance was Jerusalem and the temple of God. So why were Dan and Ephraim left out of the list? The tribes of Ephraim and Dan did not appear in this list because they introduced idolatry into the nation of Israel. This fact can be found in the following passages, Judges 18 verses 30 and 1 Kings 12, 26 to 33. So the original sin of idolatry in the land of Israel has its payback in these last days. These two tribes were deprived of the opportunity to testify of their Messiah. In Matthew 24 verses 14, Jesus speaks of the witnessing ministry of the 144,000 Jews when he says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So what is the gospel? The gospel is God's plan of sending His Son as a saviour of lost humanity. In other words, the story of Jesus, the only human being without sin who sacrificed himself for sinful man and woman. In the Old Testament, this story was told through means of symbols such as animal sacrifices and temple rituals. John the Baptist told the same story in John 3 verses 36 
and Jesus told the same story to a Pharisee named Nicodemus in John 3.16, and the disciples told that story in the early days of the church. However, notice that Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Jesus is creating a special and often overlooked link between the gospel and what he calls the kingdom. John the Baptist and Jesus both preached the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. They announced that the messianic kingdom, which had been long foretold by the prophets, was at hand, because Jesus the king was in their midst. Of course, the problem for the Jews of that day was that Jesus was not the kind of king that they were expecting. In their eyes, their king would be a conqueror that would deliver them from Roman oppression. The kingdom that Jesus came to establish was far, far greater than a mere political system. Its purpose was to deal with sin. Israel was expecting a king, but a very different kind of king, and they did not recognize him. On Palm Sunday, just days before his crucifixion, Jesus deliberately fulfilled the ancient prophecy of Zechariah as he rode a donkey down the side of the Mount of Olives to the cheers and praises of the people of Jerusalem. This prophecy says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Christ's 144,000 witnesses will fulfill the word of Jesus that the same gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations before the final judgment of God will descend upon the earth. These 144,000 servants will proclaim this gospel during the seven-year period which we call the last days of the time of the tribulation. This band of spirit-filled Israelites converted to Christ after the church has been taken out of the world will go throughout the world like 144,000 Apostle Pauls. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom during the time of the cataclysmic judgments of the end times. There is an extraordinary passage in Matthew 10 which confirms this view that the 144,000 will be the ones who take the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. In this passage, Jesus sends out his disciples to preach the gospel in various parts of Israel. Here is what Matthew 10 verses 5 to 8 says These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, you received without paying, give without pay. Jesus gave further instructions to the twelve, warning them that they would not be welcome everywhere they go. A few verses later, in verses 21 to 23, Jesus' words take on a different tone. He seems to shift his focus past two millennia of time and begins to talk about the last days, when the gospel will once again be preached in Israel. It is as if the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom in the last days is merely an extension of the preaching mission Jesus gave to the twelve during his earthly ministry. Brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. What does Jesus mean when he says, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes? There is no record that Jesus ever came to the twelve after he sent them out to minister to Israel. Rather, they came back to him, reporting to him on all that they had done. There is no question that the Lord was charging the twelve and preparing to send them out. But there is a point where he leaps over the entire age in which we are living to a future time when the similar group of Israelites will be sent out on the same kind of mission the twelve disciples performed under the authority of Jesus in Matthew 10. This future group of Israelites will not be just twelve in number, but 144,000, which is twelve by twelve by ten by ten 
by 10. Jesus says to his disciples, looking beyond them, to 144,000 as yet unborn future disciples, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Another important fact to keep in the back of your mind is that many commentators and Bible teachers might refer to these 144,000 servants as Jewish missionaries, but the term Jew is misleading. The word Jew, derived from the name of one of the remaining tribes in Palestine during the time of Jesus, namely the tribe of Judah. Bible history tells us that 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel broke away in about 930 BC to form the northern kingdom of Israel, leaving only the tribes of Judah, Benjamin and Levi to rule over the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom lasted for about 210 years until it was destroyed by Assyria in 722 BC. And when they conquered Israel, they forced the ten tribes to scatter throughout their empire. These Israelites disappeared from history permanently, and they are called the ten lost tribes of Israel, because the Assyrians did not settle the Israelites in one place, but scattered them in small populations all over the Middle East. However, the good news is that God, in His mercy, has promised the reuniting of the northern and southern kingdoms. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that this would happen in Isaiah 11 verses 12 to 13, when he said, He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. This will occur when the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, will begin his millennial kingdom, and all hostility, jealousy, and conflict between the tribes will be put to rest. But before this occurs, these 144,000 specially sealed servants mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 will come from the ranks of all the tribes of Israel, excluding Dan and Ephraim, and not just the tribes of Judah, Benjamin and Levi, who were the only Israelites left in the land during the time of Jesus. There is a wonderful encouraging scripture in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, that talks about the day of the Lord. The last three verses of the book of Malachi promises, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and the book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Malachi says that the Lord knows about them, and the Lord has a book, and in that book are written the names of those who fear the Lord, and when the day of wrath arrives, God will protect them. God knows who belongs to Him, and who He chooses to protect. In the destruction that God brought in the flood, He knew how to protect the eight people that He wanted to save. In the destruction that came in the city of Jericho, He knew how to protect the one woman He wanted to save, Rahab. In the destruction that came to Sodom and Gomorrah, He knew how to protect the family He wanted to save, the family of Lot. God knows who He will protect and save. When the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath comes, it is going to consume the ungodly, but some of the godly will survive. And one of the groups that will survive are here identified as these 144,000 special disciples, 12,000 out of each of the tribes of Israel. Israel rejected their Messiah when He came the first time, and God has promised that the next time they will not. Israel will see their Messiah and through the 144,000 sealed servants, Israel will become the witness nation that God has always intended them to be. That is why God called them in the first place. These 144,000 will be the greatest force of missionaries that the world has ever known, and the result of their effort will be a redeemed Israel and a redeemed humanity. What does that tell us about God? That tells us that God is faithful no matter how complex and difficult it is. 
After all the heartache that Israel has caused him, he will not forget his ultimate purpose for that nation. Neither will he forget his purpose for those of us who are his children. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 33.